Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. It is fantastic to see so many of you uh, in attendance. As I said, we have over 900, about 950 people have registered to attend this meeting on Zoom. There are more uh, joining us. This is streaming live on PSC's Facebook and on Carboos of Facebook. My name is Ben Jamal. I'm the director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, and we are absolutely delighted to be hosting this meeting in partnership uh, with our friends at the Council for Arab British Understanding, Carbu. Let me just say a couple of words about how we're going to organize this. In a minute, I'm going to introduce our two speakers, and I will then take them through a series of questions which will focus upon the conclusions and findings of the Betzalem report on apartheid and why they matter. I will then hand over to Chris Doyle, the director of Carbu, who will open up the floor. Uh, for questions from all of you. Please post your questions in the chat. If you, you will see that you can direct those questions at, to James at PSC, he will collate them. They will then be passed on to Chris. And we, when we get to that part of the meeting, we will try to make sure we answer as many as we can. We want to make this meeting as inclusive as possible. So to do that, we ask that any contributions, first of all, are ideally focused on the issues we're discussing tonight, but crucially, that they adhere to the core aims, values, and principles that we all share, including opposition to all forms of discrimination. And I need to remind people that anyone who violates those principles will be removed from the session. So let me move to introduce our two speakers. Diana Butu is a lawyer who previously served as a spokesperson for the PLO and was part of the team that assisted in the successful litigation of the war be before the International Court of Justice. She frequently comments on Palestine for international news media outlets such as CNN and BBC. She's a political analyst for Al Jazeera and for the Al Shabata, Shabaka network. She's a regular contributor to the Middle East magazine and she maintains a law practice in Palestine focusing on international human rights law. And Hage Elad is an Israeli human rights activist who has served as the Director General of Betzalem since May 2014. Previously, he was Director of the Association for Civil Rights in Israel and the Jerusalem Open House for Pride and Tolerance. Now, for many decades, Israel and its allies have been able to sustain a false narrative, a cloak of illusion, if you like, that has successfully shaped mainstream political discourse and served to shield Israel from accountability for its continuing violations of international law. And this illusion seeks to present Israel to the world as a liberal democracy that is maintaining a temporary military occupation in East Jerusalem Gaza and the West Bank. Now, Betzalem's report produced earlier this year is the latest piece of analysis that tears away this cloak of illusion, but a piece of analysis particularly significant because of its source. Betzalem, Israel's most important human rights monitoring organization. The conclusions of this report, which we will unpack in detail, is that there are not two parallel regimes a liberal democracy inside the Green Line, inside the State of Israel, and outside an oppressive military occupation. Rather, that there is one regime governing the entire area and the people living in it, based on a single organizing principle. Now, we meet on the brink, on the very eve of the Israeli election. Betzalem's analysis tells us starkly that no matter the result, no matter who now becomes charged with steering the regime, the regime will not change, and the regime is an apartheid regime. Now, apartheid is often used in political discourse pejoratively to express opprobrium. In this way, it's often used perhaps to describe a particular practice or a discrete act, such as in recent contexts describing Israel's failure to offer vaccines to Palestinians under occupation as an act of vaccine apartheid. But apartheid is a legal term. Under the, the Rome Statute, it is defined, and I quote, as inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other 
racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. So to describe, to accuse a state of practicing apartheid is a grave and serious charge and should be considered as such. So let me begin, Haggai, by asking you, what led Bet Salem to this grave conclusion? Thank you. Thank you for that introduction and for the question. And I want to thank both uh, PSC and Kabu for uh, convening us this evening and to thank the many hundreds of people that are taking the time uh, to listen in and take part in this, in this conversation. Thank you all so, so much. Um, I'm sure that, uh, I hope that people will appreciate that uh, for B'Tselem that was founded back in 1989, so just over three decades ago, uh, what a significant um, moment that is uh, for organization that is absolutely focused for all of its work only on the human rights realities uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories to take the step and for the first time in, in the history of the organization to make a river to the sea analysis uh, is no small moment. Um, we came to this conclusion, first obviously because uh, we were convinced that this is the accurate way to look at the, at the reality, but also with a sense of, uh, not just a sense of, of awakening, but also uh, I would say a sense of, a sense of, of optimism that perhaps, with, which comes obviously on top of a lot of frustration and, and rage and, 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 and sadness in view of the ongoing realities that are not met with the adequate response. So this is about both calling things with a proper name, but also with the optimism that if the correct analysis is finally attached to the situation, if people wake up to reality, then maybe we have a fighting chance of it finally, very belatedly, being addressed uh, properly. Um, and, and I'll talk in a, in a minute about like the two recent developments that like convinced us that the threshold have been crossed, but also obviously uh, others have been making this, taking this position already for quite some time, uh, Palestinian analysts and commentators, scholars and NGOs. Uh, so obviously we are not the first ones, uh, but I do hope that we've made a significant contribution to mainstreaming uh, what we think is the essential lens through which the situation here needs to be understood. And I also want to say, and again, with a sense of optimism, that we're not going to be the last ones that are going to say this. And that with the accumulation of the work and the voice and, and the gravitas of Palestinian uh, scholars that have been taking this position, and then more, more recently, B'Tselem, and hopefully also others, that we will all together be successful in making the world wake up to what is actually happening between the river and the sea. I said that uh, we have opted for this uh, also because just quote unquote, it's, it's the truth. These are the facts. And I'm emphasizing this because I also, I mean, also Ben, as you related in your opening remarks, because it's important that people understand that this is not uh, just a, a new angry word. Uh, that we want to throw into the, the, the debate. Um, yes, we're angry. I think people should be very angry about, about what's going on. Uh, but B'Tselem has always been very cool-headed uh, and obsessed with being factual and very careful with the analysis and, uh, and the language. This is the correct word. This is the appropriate analysis. And attached to it need to be uh, the appropriate consequences that we are yet uh, to see. Okay, uh, last thing I, I just want to throw in because of you related to the timing where we're having this conversation just on the eve of, uh, of the elections uh, and to say also what uh, to acknowledge that and to say what a, what a gut-wrenching experience it is to, to observe uh, this in, in so many ways, uh, the way elections in Israel are not in fact a quote unquote celebration of democracy, but in fact it's another occasion in which the subjugation and the denial of rights of Palestinians uh, is even more spelled out in a more prominent way with the backdrop of this false uh, sense of, uh, of democracy. And if anyone needed even a more visible uh, expression of that, then it was the event just the other day uh, with the backdrop of the Palestinian community of, of Khan al-Ahmar, just east of, of Jerusalem, 
with Israeli Jewish politicians bidding, uh, overbidding each other with the backdrop of a community that they want to forcibly transfer. They want to you know, encourage the government, the next government, uh, they're critiquing the current government for not having done so, not having moved forward with the war crime of the forcible transfer of an entire Palestinian community. Uh, and basically using the backdrop of the community that they want to erase as political football to advance their, you know, get more votes at the expense of, uh, of, such, a, of such a terrible, a terrible action. Uh, so this is a, a, also like a better time to, to be in this conversation. And also with, with an understanding that again, no matter what the details of the vote are going to be, any fair assessment of public opinion in Israel will come to the conclusion that there is a broad consensus, a very broad consensus amongst Jewish voters that they're absolutely fine with one way or another of permanent subjugation of Palestinians, of permanent domination uh, of uh, Jewish people in the entire area that people are totally fine with apartheid. Um, so that needs to be said uh, because that's uh, the reality that we live in. Finally, just to zoom in on the, the two recent developments that compelled us to you know, recently come to this conclusion at the backdrop of this much broader research uh, is two uh, moments. One is 2018, the passage of the, the new basic law, uh, as well as the nation state of the Jewish people. Uh, and with that, I want to emphasize this. What we are not saying is that policy-based discrimination against Palestinian citizens have begun in 2018. No, that has begun in 1948 when the state was established. That has been de facto for seven decades without the passage of that basic law. But what the basic law has done, it has elevated that pre-existing reality to a constitutional level. It has enshrined it through a basic law. Uh, and that's a moment of unmasking uh, of the reality that was already in place before that. In a parallel, in a similar way, on the other side of the green line, the discussion that uh, played out over much of 2020 around the Trump plan uh, and perhaps the further a formal annexation of additional parts of the, of the occupied West Bank. Again, the Israeli policies all over the West Bank uh, to advance the interests of Jewish settlers at the expense of the rights of Palestinians, none of that has waited for formal annexation. And obviously none of that has stopped with formal annexation not moving forward in the meantime. But what 2020 spelled out is the in broad daylight, the open Israeli intention to spend less time wasting our time on lip service to the two-state solution and just saying our intention is to control, continue controlling the entire area without giving Palestinian rights. To move that into daylight with open American backing at, at the time and to say that in a clearer way. And with both of these developments in 2018 and 2020, we came to the conclusion that the threshold has been passed and the regime needs to be named for what it is, apartheid. Thank, thank you, Haggai. And uh, look, as you say, we hope that the Betzalem report can be, and it should be crucial uh, in helping to mainstream, ma mainstream this apartheid uh, narrative. We've posted a link to the report in the chat. If you haven't read it, uh, please do. It, not only is it crucial, uh, it is cogent uh, and it is extremely accessible in terms of how it is written. We are going to drill down on some of the aspects uh, of the report, but before we do that, um, Diana, obviously, as Haggai said, Betzalem is not the first organisation to make this charge. Other scholars, political analysts, and of course, key swathes of Palestinian civil society uh, have reached the same conclusion, a particularly important report, and we will put this one, a link to this one also in the chat, uh, was that produced by Richard Falk and Prof Professor Virginia Tilly uh, for the UN in 2017, a report suppressed after intensive lobbying by Israel and the US. Now, Diana, you, this apartheid analysis is one that you share. Can you tell us why? Uh, first, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first, thank you for the, to the PSC for inviting me into Cabo and to everybody who's attending. And I especially want to thank Hagai, my co-panelist, co 
uh, both for being the co-panelist on this, but also for um, taking B'Tselem to a direction that uh, over the years we've seen such a, a sea change and uh, we've seen how he has directed B'Tselem to really become, to focus and become a spotlight on Israel and to, to force people to really look at how it is that Israel is seeing itself. Um, so thank you, Haggai. Um, with that said, to, I, I want to, to say that you're absolutely right, Ben. There are so many people who have used this analysis in the past, and, and just a few that come to mind, um, uh, people like Nimr Sultani or Hassan Jabarin or uh, Rafif Ziadi or Raif Zreik uh, and others who have written about this for many, many, many years. And, uh, and so I'm heartened uh, to see that B'Tselem is also sharing this perspective and seeing that it's very important to listen to Palestinian voices who are the victims of this apartheid and to project it um, forward. Um, you know, it's very important. What, what Haggai said was really quite important in that you know, there has been talk about Israel being an apartheid state for many, many years. Um, somebody who I don't think anybody would consider to be a radical was Jimmy Carter, wrote a whole book about it in 2006 uh, and, and came under a lot of heat for writing about it in 2006. But what was important um, in, with this, with this Batsalem report is that it, unlike the 2006 uh, book by Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, which only focused on apartheid in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip and the occupied Palestinian territories, that the B'Tselem report takes it a step further and looks at this as the regime as a whole. And this is where it becomes so vitally important that this is where our focus remains and stays. You know, it's, it's a myth if we think that somehow we can separate out the settlements from from the rest of the country um, to say that somehow the green line is this magic line. It's, there is no magic line. It's been erased for as long as, as the occupation has taken shape. And in fact, this has been one of the intentions is to try to fully erase the green line and make sure that this is simply uh, operating as one country, as one entity, as one state but with different classes of rights within that one entity, one country, one state. Um, so for example, you don't see that in the settlements that there's a separate banking law in the settlements versus inside Tel Aviv. You don't see that there's a sign as you, as you drive into, um, into the West Bank that says, you know, welcome to occupied territory, it doesn't exist. All of it has functionally operated as one country with different classes of rights uh, in between it. I think also to step back, and I, I, appreciate, um, I appreciate Haggai's statement that the, the system of apartheid didn't, or, and certainly discriminatory laws, didn't just begin with the passage of the Jewish nation state law, that it predates this. It's the, the, it, the, the state itself and the way that, if you look at the way that Palestinian citizens of Israel have been treated, from 1948 until the current day, it again falls within this regime of apartheid, of trying to maintain domination over one group and suppressing the other group, uh, one group maintaining domination over another. And we saw this, for example, from between the period of 1948 until 1966, where Palestinian citizens of Israel were living under a, a similar regime to that that exists right now in the West Bank, um, of military occupation, where there was martial, where there was military rule that was in place at the time, and that continued to operate even after um, 1966, with the official "quote unquote" end of it. It simply wasn't an end, but simply an easing of it. And so, for Palestinians who've lived under this regime from, from 1948 until the current day. All that we have seen and all that we've lived under is different shades of a, of an, of a domination, of an of a, of a attempt to control, to dominate, and to in fact deny us our self-determination. That's really at the core of it. 
And so I appreciate very much um, both the writing of this report and the, the advocacy that has been done around the report because this needs to be mainstreamed. Now, just a word about um, the, the reflection of reality versus the way that it's, uh, uh, that is viewed here. Um, you know, the term apartheid here, uh, it, 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 is, it doesn't have that same negative connotation yet that it does around the world. For many years, um, Israelis have been hearing the term apartheid and, um, and have, have heard it from, you know, from heads of state onward and seem somehow to be immune to it. So immune to it are they that while this, while the B'Tselem report really registered very heavily in international media, with a couple of um, notable exceptions, uh, that inside Israel it didn't have the same impact, the same, the same negative impact, or in the sense of looking at it as saying, "Wow, this is this is the wake up call that we need," and this is largely because this is what it means to be living in a system of privilege and apartheid. When you're part of the privileged class, you don't need to look around and say, well, maybe what we're doing is incorrect or wrong. It, um, you become very much uh, immune to it. And in the case of Israelis here, um, the, the immunity stems from the fact that that, that the rest of the world continues to treat Israel as though it's somehow a liberal democracy, which it is not. I just want to end my remarks by um, just giving a couple of quick snippets about this election. And, and I, I'm so delighted that Haggai has pointed out that we are on the eve of a fourth election taking, taking place in two years. Um, what was fascinating, what's been fascinating about this election is not only the fact that, that uh, Khan al-Ahmar has served as a backdrop, but that in each of these elections that we've seen over the course of the past um, two years, that, that Palestinians always serve as the backdrop. And the, the theme is oftentimes who is going to be tougher, who's going to be harder, who's going to hit Palestinians more. And whether that is um, Benny Gantz very proudly proclaiming that he bombed Gaza back to the Stone Age, um, or Lieberman who put forward ads uh, saying that he was going to, uh, that Palestinians would fear him as Minister of Defense and Prime Minister, or uh, Bennett who very proudly proclaimed what he's going to do when it comes to Khan al-Ahmar, or, um, or otherwise, or even when it comes to Palestinian uh, citizens of Israel, that the entire sphere of elections has been one of exerting privilege and showing privilege and exercising and displaying how much they're going to continue to dominate Palestinians. Thank you, Diana. Can I remind people, we've got some fantastic questions coming in, so please keep posting your uh, questions in the chat. Uh, we want to drill down now on some of the aspects of the report. Looking at, in, in Diana's eloquent uh, phrase, looking at different aspects of different shades of domination. Now, um, Haggai, um, you say in the conclusion, a key conclusion of the report is, is that, and I quote, in the entire area between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River, the Israeli regime implements laws, practices, and state violence designed to cement the supremacy of one group, Jews, over another, Palestinians. And you focus on uh, four key arenas within which Israel perhaps can be said to cement this organizing principle. So immigration laws, which privilege the rights of Jews, control of land, restriction of freedom of movement to Palestinians, and finally denial to Palestinians of the right to political participation. I want us just to focus on some of those that may be less familiar to some of this audience. So in relation to land, you describe the policy to Judaize the area, to take over land for Jews whilst crowding Palestinians into enclaves. And that's something I think that is very familiar to people in terms of illegal Israeli settlement in the occupied territories. Can you tell us how this also serves as an accurate description of the policies exercised within the Green Line towards Palestinian citizens of Israel? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, if one looks at the general flow of um, land ownership uh, appropriation uh, and for what causes it is being used, then you see the same direction everywhere. Uh, land is taken from Palestinians, it is uh, overtaken by the state, and then it's later, uh, under almost all instances, used for the development of communities and, and towns uh, for, for Jewish development. Uh, that's been the case since 1948 uh, inside the Green Line, that's been the case since 1967 in the occupied territories. Uh, and in each of these um, sub areas uh, in the area under Israel's control, there has been a different set of, of processes, uh, always, always made legal uh, in the internal uh, Israeli system in order to, to somehow justify this and provide the guise of, uh, the guise of legality. Uh, but eventually, basically, we're looking at a very similar process in, in all of the area that, Israel's control, that Israel controls. Um, and that's a very important aspect I, that we always come back to, this guise of legality, because the, the success of this apartheid regime is not only in its ability to maintain and advance the domination and supremacy of one group of people over another, by the way, in a situation of demographic parity, right? They're close to 14 million people, one four, that live in the river and the sea, about half of them are Jewish, about half of them are Palestinian. So we're talking about this reality of like almost a demographic parity, and yet that parity is uh, managed in a way so that it will not be able to express itself in terms of uh, political power uh, or access to the resources of, of the land uh, or the allocation of, of rights and, and, and protections. But if we zoom in once again, going back to to the land and the, the ability, and also the other aspects, the ability, the, it's the success of this apartheid regime is not only in the ability to, to dominate and perpetuate this, but also to get away with it uh, internationally. And the ability to get away with it internationally is through this meticulous effort to make things legal, uh, to cross the T's and dot the I's and have due process and so on, and successfully maintain Israel's international image as a liberal democracy. And that's essential. It's not just the ability uh, to take over the land and to oppress Palestinians in all of the ways that we know. Right? It's just the ability to get away with it. And again, I come back to one of the main drives uh, behind the, 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 the optimism of calling things by the proper name, that this will finally uh, be a moment in which, together with these other developments, we will be successful to arrive closer at, at, at consequences. So inside the Green Line, uh, some of the legal mechanisms that, that were used, and, by the, and much of the time that this was implemented, obviously was during the years under which uh, Palestinian citizens were under military rule uh, inside Israel from you know, the establishment of the state, basically, until just a few months before the 1967 war. Uh, but you know the absentee property law, uh, and other mechanisms that took over land and moved it that the land that was in majority in the hands of Palestinians uh, to a situation that now some 90% of the land inside the Green Line is state owned. Uh, and I think just under 3% or around 3% of the land uh, is in the hand of Palestinians that are roughly 20% of, of the population inside the, the Green Line. So that's one measure of that. Another one is if you look at the communities that's been established, you know, it's been like more than seven decades, right? Hundreds of communities established, uh, but not a single uh, Palestinian one that was established since the state was created, besides a number of townships that were created in the Negev in the south in order to displace Bedouins from lands that were taken from them, right? Uh, and by the way, it is almost like a perfect analogy to that in terms of the situation that's been playing out in the occupied West Bank, where almost all of this, the land that Israel calls state land while pretending that the state in Palestine is Israel, right, as a justification to take over public land in the occupied territories and use it for the development of settlements and infrastructure for Jewish development and so on. But even there, what you would see that is almost 100% of the land that was designed state land was allocated for those purposes, but the tiny percentage that was not, was actually most of it was made available for Palestinians 
for sake of displacing them from other parts of the West Bank that Israel deemed to be more and more desirable. So you see even how blunt and how cynical it is in that, in that sense. And if all this is not enough, then there's also like many other examples, including the more recent uh, admission com committee's law that makes it possible uh, for many uh, relatively you know, smaller communities uh, in Israel uh, to, you know, through this mechanism of admission committees uh, and social admissibility of people uh, to communities to basically filter out uh, Palestinians uh, from living in these communities built on, on, on public land, right? Uh, so all of these me mechanisms add up, and if all that is, again, not enough, then 2018, the passage of the uh, nation state basic law in which uh, it spells out that uh, Jewish settlement uh, is, is, is a national value, right? Uh, and I think it's interesting to think about that moment and put it against the language that was used in the 1948 Declaration of Independence that promised falsely, but you know, used very different language, making the promise that the state of Israel uh, will work on the, you know, the development of, of the land for the benefit of all of its people, right? Uh, so that was a false promise that was never acted on, uh, and that's part of the maintenance of that image as a liberal democracy. And I think it's very interesting to see how seven decades later, uh, what is actually being done, what has been done for the past seven decades, and what the intention is to continue doing, is spelled out in, in a basic law in such, in such a fashion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Hagar. Um, Diana, I, I want to also pick up on the issue of um, political participation and particularly in relation to the questions of Palestinian citizens of Israel, because this is, of course, one of the arguments consistently used to suggest look, it's, it's not only inaccurate, it's fallacious to describe Israel as a, a state practicing apartheid. This argument that I'm sure is being promulgated on the eve of the uh, Israeli election across social media uh, that Palestinian citizens can vote, Palestinians can stand as members of the Knesset. So can you, can you address that and say, tell us what sense can be made of a claim of a denial of right of political participation to all Palestinians uh, inside the Green Line or without? Well, thank you, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, there's, it's, it's, it's one of those questions that's really actually kind of uh, laughable in many ways. The argument, at least, is very laughable. Yes, Palestinians can vote. Uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel can vote. The 20% of the polity can vote. Yes, that's absolutely right. But it's important to bear in mind that, it's, that there are another more than 4 million who cannot vote. And it's looking at this system of who is able to, to be represented and who is not able to be represented that becomes so vitally important. So what the attempt is, is to try to parse out Palestinians and say, well, there's no apartheid because this small little segment of you can actually vote. Whereas what we actually are is we're a nation, we are a people. And the fact that only a small segment just simply highlights the level of apartheid that actually exists. If we were so um, wanted and, and if there really was no apartheid, then they would really not have no problem with allowing the entire nation, the entire polity to be able to vote. But instead, it's this small little segment that is used as a fig leaf to try to claim that somehow Israel is a democracy. But let, I want to get big, dig down a little bit deeper. The question is, what is it that they can actually vote for? And it's very important to bear in mind that there has not been a single election ever where there hasn't been a challenge made to the candidacy of Palestinians who are citizens of Israel even trying to um, uh, run in these elections. Most recently, we saw that there were challenges by people, including a man named uh, Ben Gvir, who heads up the Jewish Power Party. This is a man who uh, very proudly dressed up as Baruch Goldstein for Purim and talks about Baruch Goldstein as being his hero. Now, just so that we all know who Baruch Goldstein is, this is the man who committed a massacre in Hebron in, the in 1994, um, 
And uh, and so Benigvir, a person who claim who's who's an whose party is an offshoot of the Mayor Kahanik, uh, Kah party, um, has the audacity to be able to put forward challenges as to who it is of, of the Palestinian citizens of Israel who can and cannot vote. Now, what is it? Who is it that they challenge? That you know, usually it's always the same uh, challenge. They challenge the com members of the Communist Party. Their challenges to the um, the National Democratic Alliance, Belad Party. Uh, there's challenges to individual members of Knesset uh, that are within those parties. But this time, his challenge was not only to those the usual suspects, to but to against a woman, a Palestinian woman, who for some odd reason, and I have no idea why, has decided to run in the Labour Party. Now, let's be clear, the Labour Party is not a radical party. It's not an anti-Zionist party. And yet even there, her participation was something that has been challenged. This is precisely what it is that the, is what, what it means to be living in this system, that even if you're going so far as to accept being a member of the Labour Party, the party of Israeli settlements, the party that has come out and uh, condemned the ICC, the party that has come out and supported each and every one of the attacks on the Gaza Strip, even then you are never going to be Zionist enough in the eyes of the state. So what it is that, that uh, it means to be living in the system is that first you have to be uh, subjected to all of these challenges because you're never viewed as being Zionist enough. And that's exactly what the intent is, is to try to turn you into a Zionist, to separate you from your people, separate you from your community and an attempt to turn you into a Zionist. That's not going to happen. The second is that um, even if you accept the Zionist parties as uh, one, of, one, uh, one of these um, members, future member of Knesset has, uh, even then, it's subject to criticism and to critique. But even more deeper than that, to be able to run in these elections, you have to, there's no way that you can accept or demand the idea of putting, pushing forward one state, equality for all, um, not accepting the apartheid regime that, that exists in place. All of that are issues that are curtailed and critiqued, and it's only within a certain square box that we are able to run and to be able to uh, participate in these elections. But then, so then it begs the question of why? And the reason that there are people who are running in these elections is because their job, they view their job as being twofold. One as being um, defense, which is to stop this machinery that is trying to um, destroy Palestinian lives, including Palestinians who are citizens of Israel, but also to try to make sure that there's an ability to survive and thrive. Now, Haggai very eloquently talked about some of the, the, the system of land that exists and all these land laws that exist when it comes to the system of apartheid. But I also want to add that, um, for, I can give you two simple, two simple examples. If you look at the city of Nazareth, the largest Palestinian city that is inside 48, inside Israel, those, the, the borders of that city have not, have not expanded since 1948. And yet we've seen a nearly a quadrupling of the population from 1948 until the current day. Now, to be clear, the people of Nazareth don't want to be living in Tel Aviv or in, or, in, or in other Israeli cities and towns. We want to have our communities to be expanded. And yet because of the system of racism, of apartheid that exists, those boundaries can never be, or have never been expanded. It's not they can't, they can, but there's a system of apartheid that is blocking it. The second example that I want to give very quickly as well, it ties into this issue that Haggai mentioned about uh, the issue of present absentees. My father's town, which is a, a town just outside of, uh, of Nazareth, um, was in 1948 completely, completely depopulated. And in its place today is a sign that says that it was established in 1951. My father was born in 1939, by the way. 
um, a sign that says that it was established in 1951. And my father and his family were all declared present absentees with all of their land taken away from them. My father is a citizen of the country. And yet even as a citizen is unable to go back and access his land just two, two kilometers away from the city of Nazareth. This is what it means to be living within this system. Yes, we have the ability to, to vote, to be able to have people in the Knesset that can try to stop some of this racist legislation. But as a whole, the system continues to perpetuate and proliferate this racist legislation. And there are many people who say that we should now be boycotting these elections because the entire system is simply designed to perpetuate racism and apartheid and that Palestinians are giving it, providing it with the fig leaf. Diana, thank you. Um, so look, for the final bit in this session, I want to just focus on uh, Israel's attempts to delegitimize, indeed, even to prescribe any attempt um, to define its laws, policies, and indeed constitutional order as racist, and moreover meeting the definition of apartheid. And these attempts, in, in, including through describing such analysis as anti-Semitic, have undoubtedly uh, created uh, a chilling uh, effect. In the concluding uh, sections, the report notes that unlike South Africa, which proudly declared itself uh, to be an apartheid state, Israel does not do so. It vehemently protests that it is a democracy, but it, as I said, it not only protests this claim, but with the support of allies makes strenuous efforts uh, to close down any attempt to define it in these terms. So can you say something, both of you, about how to respond to these attempts to delegitimize the apartheid narrative? And then also, why does it matter that Israel is understood as an apartheid state? What flows from that analysis? And can I put that question, first of all, to Diana? Um, it matters because when we view Israel as an apartheid state, which it is, there's then a whole legal element that then kicks in. Um, you know, the, the issue of apartheid, there's a convention against uh, the crime of apartheid. And this convention was not only in relation to South Africa um, or South, Southern Africa at the time, but also it was deemed to be so big that even in 1999, after the apart after apartheid in South Africa had ended, years after apartheid in South Africa had ended, the the Rome statute that governs the International Criminal Court that governs what is considered to be a crime under the International Com uh, Criminal Court also includes with it the issue of the crime of apartheid. So it's very important that we view this not just simply in light of, of, um, of, uh, of South Africa and that we not analyze it in terms of South Africa, uh, South Africa either, because yes, it's apartheid because of the structure, but it takes on very different shapes and forms. And the question is, and the issue is, is that it doesn't actually have to be copy paste for it to be apartheid. All that is necessary is for the system of domination to be present, and it is. Um, and beyond that, I th what, what, as going to why this is so important is because from there we can then start pushing for the remedies. And just as this, just as when it came to the uh, when it came to apartheid in South Africa, there were two two tracks that took shape one track being the legal track and another track being the whole BDS movement. So too, I think it's very important for us to also to be pursuing these dual tracks of one trying to hold Israel accountable um, legally, um, but also pushing for to hold Israel accountable through the BDS mechanism. So this is why for me, it is so vitally important that we label it what it is, that we move forward with it, and that we um, continue to demand the same types of remedies. I don't think that it's okay any longer uh, for Israel to, it hasn't been for a long time, for Israel to be able to be treated 
in uh, as, as though it's not a pariah state. It is a pariah state and it must be treated as one. And that for me uh, focuses on pushing forward BDS and making sure that Israel is held to account, not only for what it's doing in the occupied territories, but also what it's doing to Palestinians as a whole. And I'll leave the second part to, uh, to Haggai. So Haggai, if you can pick that up, anything you want to add about why, the, why, why these, uh, this analysis matters, but also how we should respond to these attempts to say, look, this is an illegitimate form of discourse, uh, even that to describe Israel in these terms is inherently anti-Semitic. How do we respond to such charges? Yeah. I think that, you know, going back to one of the points that was mentioned before, that, you know, Israel's success, Israel's ability to continue with this, with this situation stands on, on two feet, right? One is like the, the facts that keep accumulating at, uh, on the ground with the advancement of this, uh, this project by Israel. Uh, in all of the area it controls, uh, but also the other feat, which is key, which is the ability to move ahead with this with no consequences, not diplomatically, not economically, not legally, not in international public opinion, and, and, and so on. And that's one of the key lessons that Israel has learned from, from South Africa, how to you know do, do this also without uh, many of the you know, less visibly pleasant aspects of uh, apartheid South Africa style, like, you know, petty apartheid, you know, segregated public spaces with, you know, signs on, on benches and, and beaches. Like Israel does it in a, most of it in, in, in a very, in a very different way, in a, in a grand apartheid fashion in ways, you know, for instance, like to describe the situation that Diana mentioned around, you know, Nazareth and, and, and the Galilee, like that, that's policy based and like you, you won't find like you know a sign on, on a bus that will explain that it's all somehow in the bureaucracy of like the, the planning mechanisms and, and so on it's much more obscure uh, and it's much more internationally digestible but the actual outcome that one gets in the context of that broader regime is much more successful right you're dealing with bigger picture uh, line items that you are successful in advancing and getting away with in that in that sense so i keep coming back to this point of getting away with this this uh, uh this the, the regime's ability to get away with its its with its policies and with its essence and that needs to change and the reason that israel is so invested uh, in trying to make any criticism go away is because i i suspect that they share the same analysis, that it is essential that they manage to keep this cost-free, that they manage to keep this internationally digestible. And for that, the criticism needs to be silenced because obviously there is a chance uh, that if people will know the facts, then international public opinion will wake up and then people that live in genuine democracies will demand from them, from their elected representatives, that the foreign policy of the countries that they live in will finally be aligned with a genuine commitment to human rights and rejection of, of apartheid. Uh, and all that will eventually translate into real consequences, not just consequences you know, in, the, in the very slow moving process that may unfold in, in The Hague, in the, in the ICC, but also in ways that involve independent decisions that will be made by various countries in terms of their relations with, with Israel and also at the UN and in other multilateral arenas, right? So there's a chain here that all of it begins with the critis criticism from the ground of the, of the reality. And because of that, there's a need to silence that criticism, right? Um, now, usually uh, the way Palestinian colleagues are, you know, Israel tries to silence them is through invoking false accusations of supporting uh, violence, of dubbing them as, as terrorists, right? I'm not making this up. There's like, you know, official government reports that describe Palestinian human rights activists as, as terrorists, terrorists in suits, right? That's the name of that report. Um, and with regard to Israelis, uh, Jewish Israelis, uh, we would often be described as traitors, right? Uh, but internationally, the tool that is most often deployed is false accusations of anti-Semitism, right? 
That's uh, what the government does. Uh, and as we all know, that has been a rather successful uh, chilling mechanism because anti-Semitism is a serious issue. It's a serious allegation. Uh, and it is something that people that are anti-Semitic indeed need, need to be rejected and need to be called out as, as such. And we all need to be very serious in identifying anti-Semitism and defeating it at the same way that we should defeat any form of, uh, of racism. But it's a very, very, uh, I would say, inconvenient accusation to deal with. And like any smear, uh, as you know, any person that does this kind of like false propaganda knows, the moment you throw the smear at someone, it's, re it's really very, very difficult to move, uh, to, get, to get away fr from that. So we are living in a reality in which people around the world know, elected officials and activists and other, that the moment that they cross Israel's line and that they speak out against, by the way, not just you know calling the, the regime as uh, apartheid and so on, but then speak out against like specific human rights violations in the occupied territories, right? Um, beyond the green line, not in the context of apartheid, in the context of IHL and so on, Israel will have none of it, right? You would be smeared as an anti semite uh, on, on those grounds alone, right? That's the reality, and everyone's aware of that. So basically, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a moral choice, right? There's like people just know that if they do it, if they speak out, they're going to have to deal with that kind of, uh, of, of accusation. Um, and I, I'm saying this with, you know, with, with, with sadness, because this is terrible in, 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 in so many ways. It's terrible because, yes, there are genuine anti-Semites, right? And we lose credibility. Uh, in fighting against them if false accusations are just invoked in order to silence Palestinians, right? And silence those that are trying to build a future based on, on justice and equality on this, uh, on this land. And it's even more awful because there are all these, you know, growing number of autocratic uh, heads of state around the world that are genuinely anti-Semitic, right? You know, from the former uh, until recently U.S. president, Mr. Trump, uh, to uh, you know the, the, the leader of uh, Hungary and other countries, right? And since they are supportive of Israel's perpetual oppression of Palestinians with no consequences, then Israeli leaders will be very careful not to speak out against these real anti-Semites, right? Uh, so. It's so cynical, like you, you sacrifice the credibility that one needs you know, to defeat anti-Semitism while legitimizing genuine anti-Semites because what you want to do with is continue oppressing another people and get away with it, right? It's like morally bankrupt across the board, right? And I think the only way, the only way that we can successfully deal with this is one by being aware but this isn't going anywhere, right? You know, from Israel's perspective, this has been successful so far. You know, just, you know, ever since, the, you know, there's been finally some more traction in The Hague with regard to the, the investigation by, by the ICC, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, like not some random, you know, backbencher, but like, you know, the Prime Minister of the state has repeatedly named the ICC as, you know, as an anti-Semitic institution, right? And how many statements have we heard from high-level officials around the world that have said, like, this is just not acceptable. It's not acceptable for the Israeli prime minister to speak in this way against, uh, against the, the ICC, regardless of what people think about the investigation that we fully support and think that is essential. But regardless of that, to use such language and intimidation against the ICC, totally unacceptable. And we haven't heard that kind of response to Netanyahu's uh, statement. So from the Israeli perspective, this is successful. And as long as it's successful, it is not going to stop. And the only way to deal with it is to realize that that's the case, to be very clear about our positions in rejection of all forms of racism, including anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and being very clear about our moral commitment to justice and equality and freedom and self-determination for all of the people that live in this place.
Hang on, Diana. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over now to my co-host, Chris Doyle, our Director of Carver, who's going to chair us through the Q&A. Thank you very much, Ben. It's a great pleasure for Carbu to be co-hosting with PSC today. And a huge thanks to our speakers for terrific presentations, both Haggai and Diana. Um, we're going to have a Q&A, so please do put your questions in the chat function, though I'm glad to say we've got many very, very good ones coming up. And we'll try and take as many as possible, and I'll try to group them together thematically for our speakers. Now, before that, I just want to say on behalf of Carbu that we'd like to you know, thank Betzellem for this excellent report, another great report. We're really great, grateful to them and uh, for partnering with them uh, over the years. They briefed us uh, uh, parliamentary delegations and meetings, uh, as indeed has, has Diana. And actually, to answer one of the questions in the chat, um, have British MPs seen the report? The all-party group, uh, Carbu's the secretariat of that, the all-party group on Palestine, hosted Beit Salem, where we discussed that report. So um, do, by all means, encourage your MPs to, to, to read it and act on it. So um, delighted to be hosting this. Also, um, because of the acute need to draw attention to this issue of systematic discrimination of life uh, in an apartheid system for Palestinians, um, and I think that it's, it is very important that Bet Salem has now referred to this as apartheid, as indeed many Palestinians and international groups have as well. And it's a very, as Ben said, a very detailed, factual, clear report in the style that we've become accustomed to. So um, very sadly, when we challenged this, and I just wanted to say something on this system of discrimination that should be dismantled, that... <clears throat> those who do that, who want to challenge this sort of discrimination, are described as racist and anti-Semitic. And indeed, Kabu is uh, accused of unambiguous Jew hatred just purely for hosting such a meeting. And that is shameful for all the re reasons that Haggai has just said. And none of these accusers address the systematic discrimination or the war crimes, uh, the other crimes, uh, the apartheid system at all. Uh, so they attack the messengers and not the message. And we're not going to be intimidated by all of that. Um, and we're going to continue to base our arguments in the core root values of equality, human rights and justice. So um, <clears throat> we're very much here acting in solidarity with those groups who, who are attacked, including Beit Salem, the shrinking space in which they operate. So huge thank you to them. Now, we've got a bunch of questions and the first lot really are to do with the issue of <clears throat> apartheid itself. And then we'll move on more to what possibly we can all do about this, what the international community can and should do. So there's a question for Haggai, I'll give him a couple, whether there was unanimity with Bet Salem concerning, concerning this analysis of apartheid. Did everybody within the organization agree? Was it, was it contested? And secondly, a question that often comes up, is it useful? to use this term apartheid. Many politicians, even if they agree with the analysis, see it as divisive, certainly something I've heard a, a, a lot about. And also a few Haggai, uh, does Betzalem advocate for the Palestinian right of return for refugees? So we we'll start with Haggai. Thank you. Um, so first, with regard to the, the position of the organization, um, yeah, we had very thorough internal discussions on this issue over an extended period of time in developing our, our thinking and analysis on this, on this issue. And as I said in the beginning, it was also you know, specifically complicated for us because our expertise is with regard to human rights in the occupied territories beyond, beyond the Green Line. So it also involved educating ourselves uh, with regard to the realities uh, inside the green line uh, and to see whether this analysis adds up and makes sense to us, which it absolutely did. Uh, and I'm very proud of the process that, that we had internally that involved you know, the entire team and obviously the board of the organization, obviously such steps are steps that uh, could only move forward with the, you know, the backing of the, the leadership of the of the board of the organization. So I'm very proud both of the team and of the board uh, that 
really, I think, shaped the, the thinking and the framing and, and the language and the you know, very fine tuning of the, of the position of the organization uh, through, this, uh, through this report. Uh, and also to say that uh, this is now going to inform our thinking and our analysis Looking, looking forward, right? This is not a one-off, and, and that's just because other actors hopefully will be taking this position looking forward, but also because it is now part of the way we look at, at reality. It's changed the way we analyze the, the situation. So I hope that as people continue to read, you know, the uh, reports and, uh, and position papers, uh, that this issue will be revisited. And in that sense, I really like to point out the most recent report that we published uh, with regard to Israel's settlement policy in, in the West Bank, that is the first report that we published under this broader umbrella of analyzing a specific uh, aspect uh, under the broader um, worldview of, uh, of apartheid. So I also recommend taking a look at that and, and that report because it also touches on many of the issues that we didn't have a chance to expand on in today's, uh, today's conversation. Now, with regard to whether this is this is helpful, uh, so we'll, uh, the short answer is we'll see, right? Uh, and um, you know, and we could have asked the same question with regard to like you know whether only talking in the you know realm of international humanitarian law was that helpful? Uh, people have tried that for a very long time, uh, and yet we are where we are. Uh, IHL also ha has a lot of you know protections for the occupied people. Uh, there should have been consequences for violations of IHL. Israel has enjoyed impunity also like in that context, uh, and yet we are what, what, where we are. Um, but I think the question for us is beyond that. It's first is, it's not just whether this is helpful, but first whether this is accurate, whether this is the, the right way to look at things. Uh, and just because we are the human rights organization that we are, if we come to a conclusion, then we have a moral obligation to share it with, with the public uh, in a way that's almost independent of whether or how it's going to be effective or not. Having said that, I'm also, as I said before, optimistic that this will be um, um, effective uh, in moving things forward in the directions that we think are uh, indeed essential. And I want to point out and I think that that's essential that like there is so much effort in trying to not look at the situation in this way and also like to always pretend that the problem is somewhere else and that the problem is in the future right and that goes back to the the worldview that we want to you know point out that has become untethered to reality which is that you know democracy plus permanent democracy inside the green line liberal democracy Jewish democracy inside the green line uh, with a temporary occupation attached to it on the other side of the ground. Democracy plus, plus occupation. And always saying that it's two minutes to midnight and only if you know, certain additional steps would be taken, then it would, be, it, would become a, it would become apartheid. Like that was much of the language around um, um, the plan for formal annexation. But if you would have you know, rewinded not just a year back, but five years back or 10 years back or more, it always is like somehow still two minutes to midnight. If only another settlement will be built, then something will happen uh, and so on. The clock has been stuck in, in that situation for a very long time already. And we have to move beyond that. We have to move beyond that if we want to arrive at, at, at consequences. Otherwise, it's just gonna be, you know, people will have the same conversation in five years and you would be surprised that it's still five minutes to midnight or two minutes to midnight, and there's nothing that you need to really wake up to. No, it's not two minutes to midnight. The clock hasn't been stuck for the past 20 years. It is apartheid, and we need to address it as, uh, as such. Uh, and with regard to the last question, uh, the way we address it in the report is through the discussion of the privileged, uh, it's one of the main four pillars of apartheid that we describe, which is the one which is focusing on the demographic re-engineering of the space that Israel controls and the way Israel makes it possible for any Jewish person from anywhere in the world to immigrate to Israel, by the way, not just Israel, also to the occupied territories, to immigrate to anywhere between the river and the sea that Israel controls uh, and gain uh, rights and citizenship, including political rights, almost immediately, while 
exactly the opposite reality is uh, presented before Palestinians, not only with regard to their ability uh, to come to Israel inside the Green Line, but also to come to the occupied territories. Thank you very much, Haggai. Now, um, a couple of questions um, for Diana. Uh, Diana, um, just a few questions on, on the media here. Do you think the media is balanced in its reporting of um, Israel-Palestine and how might you address that if you think not? And what can be done in response to the criticism being wrong, uh, the criticism of Israel being wrongly called anti-Semitic? Uh, Haggai spoke about that, but why doesn't the media explain the difference between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? And then if I could just ask you to comment also on a question about the PA, Palestinian Authority. Um, why doesn't the Palestinian Authority demand the equality of Jews and Palestinians as a prerequisite of negotiations? Um, okay, the, great question. So I think I'll start backwards. Um, on the issue of why don't they demand equality as a prerequisite for negotiations, it depends on what you mean by equality. So there were demands for equality in terms of equal statehood, not equal citizenship. There were demands of equality for equal statehood. And what I mean by that is that um, early on, there was demands that, that Palestinians be able to provide, have their own security, that they'd be able to have their own uh, borders, that they would be in control of their own financial system. Um, control the airspace, control the territorial waters. I mean, there were those demands of equality. It then, you know, dropped with as time went on, and they started to accept things like a demilitarized state, which I don't understand why. Um, to then all of these other, you know, drops drops uh, that happen. But in terms of demanding equality as in one state. That has not happened. And the reason that that has not happened is because, um, look, to be clear, the numbers are still showing that people still want to see their own independent state. And there are reasons for it. Um, they've lived for, for half a century with, with uh, Israel's boot at their, at their neck. And, um, and they're quite frankly, quite tired of it. So when people speak of one state, it's not the way that I speak of one state, of, of, um, of a system of dismantling the, the settler colonial regime, of decolonization, etc. But for them, it's, it's this idea of like, we're going to have to live under, under Israel's thumb. No, we want our own self that we want our own self determination. We want to have our own state. And so very much, so the PA very much mimics that. And, um, and not only mimics that, but also uses it to their advantage. They want to have their own state. They want to be the ones in charge. You know, power power um, protects itself. That's the way that it that it works. Um, but in terms of e uh, like equality of sit of um, of statehood, yes, that that was a demand that was made. It's since been whittled down, but never equality when it comes to just this equality within the one state. Um, in terms of the media. They do. There's a. Where do I begin? Um, the fact that we're even asking for balance is a problem, because balance already favors the privileged class, and be, and it balance already favors the 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 place that has a state or the people that have a state. That's what balance does. Instead, what the where there should be focus is what it's like to live daily. Under, Ismail, under Israel's rule. That's the part that we never see the, we thought we never, but it's rare to see the overall context. It's rare for journalists, particularly, you know, in these few seven minute news segments or three minute news segments, I don't know how short they are these days, for them to provide the context. And I'm not talking about the entire history, but just the simplicity of what it means to be living as a second-class citizen within your within on your homeland in your homeland, or what it means to be living under Israel's military rule, these are things that they rarely cover. So what does get covered a lot 
and where people are demanding quote unquote balance is that if there are, if there's um, something that happens militarily, they demand balance. But the bigger issue is do Palestinians, uh, do, um, do, do viewers understand, do they walk away with a sense that Palestinians are living under a very brutal military regime? Do they walk away with a sense that Palestinians are living as second-class citizens? On this level, they don't. They don't. I don't see that that is something that permeates uh, across the board when it comes to the media. I do get the sense that um, that they love to view this as a quote unquote conflict, and therefore, it, because it's a quote unquote conflict, it needs both sides. But this is beyond that. This is an, an instance where where it's a it's a settler colonial it's colonialism, and we need to be hearing from people about what it's like to live under this regime, what our experiences are, not what it's like to be a soldier, but what it's actually like to be as a person who is suffering the weight of the regime. And I'll give you a couple of examples. When Palestinians get killed, you will see things like allegedly killed. You know, that word alleged somehow makes its way in. Um, or there will be you know, Palestinian sources say, but when, when it's an Israeli soldier, and I'm, I'm specifically saying soldier, the terminology becomes Israeli. In other words, we remove the context of military rule and it's no longer allegedly, it's there's definitely a perpetrator and there's no longer a, a source. It's just, this is the way that, that the rules and the facts are. I think a lot more work needs to be done to providing the context to providing the reality to providing voice to Palestinians who are living under this brutal regime and to stop seeking this quote unquote balance because balance is simply going to favor this the the privileged side thank you very much that reminds me of endless meetings with bbc editors on this issue of um, <coughs> of balance um just uh, either of you really can come on to the, the, these next two questions. Um, how does apartheid discrimination affect access to medicine and how women fighting breast can cancer impacted? Um, and there's another question, uh, are Druze and Christians living in Israel treated as badly as Arab Muslims in Israel? Um, who, uh, would either of you like to take the issue about medical access? Diana. Yeah, I'm happy to take the issue of medical access. So um, I'm sure you've been hearing this term of medical apartheid, particularly surrounding um, the, the COVID vaccines that have been provided. Um, but medical apartheid didn't just start with the pandemic. Medical apartheid has existed here for a very long time. Uh, for example, there isn't a single Palestinian hospital that is allowed to have radiation equipment, you know, the equipment that's needed to treat many forms of cancer and in particular breast cancer. And the reason that no Palestinian hospital is allowed to have it, neither in the Gaza Strip nor in the West Bank, you hear this uh, mostly about the Gaza Strip, but it's also the case in the West Bank. The reason that neither, uh, uh, no hospital in either the West Bank or the Gaza Strip is allowed to have it is because it, um, it doesn't meet with Israel's quote unquote security uh, requirements. And so what that means is that any person who actually needs to, to have any radiation treatment, um, breast cancer or otherwise, uh, actually has to obtain Israeli permission to be treated in an Israeli hospital or, to, or they have to travel abroad. And I mean, I'm sure it goes without saying that cancer doesn't wait for these permissions to be issued. It doesn't wait for, for, for paperwork. It doesn't, doesn't pause the spread as we're waiting for, for the application process of, uh, and, and waiting for this, for the, for, to be able to get treatment or not get treatment. Um, it just goes on ahead. And yet that is something that is, again, very much overlooked. The, the, uh, we do hear about it when it comes to the Gaza Strip, but also there only rarely, um, mostly in the relation to denials. But it's also the case when it comes to the West Bank as well. So there's a whole system of medical apartheid that exists that predates the pandemic. And it's so vitally important that 
that um, when dealing with the issue of apartheid that we also focus on the medical side of things. Thank you very much. We're, we're, we're running short on time, so I perhaps wanted to switch a little bit to the, the other half of the questions about what we can actually do and, and how, how to address these things. So we've got various questions. Um, I'll, I'll summarise some of them for both of you. Um, what the UK can do about it, what we can get our MPs to do about it. Somebody has asked about Ireland that is now on the Security Council and what can Ireland do to, to uh, uh, support uh, Palestine. And it, some have asked also about the ICC, plenty of questions about that. And do you think this is symbolic or do you think actually something will, will come of it? Will there be a, a, a result in, in all of this? Um, so perhaps we could just put it to, uh, to Haggai first, you know, what, you know, you've written this report, what do you really hope the international community, what do you hope supporters of uh, rights, etc., will do? Okay, so first let me just be, be in the context of the ICC, I'll, I'll just say that it is important and it could be important, but it shouldn't, and it should be supported and should be protected to carry out uh, its work free from intimidation, uh, but it is not a replacement for uh, the responsibility of international public opinion and of governments around the world. It is not a substitute for that. And also, as anyone that's familiar with the work of, of the ICC knows, uh, it's a very slow process. It's gonna take years further uh, in the best case uh, scenario, and I'm not even sure that we're there, right? But that legal process needs to move forward in its independent and coherent fashion. And no one should pretend that, you know, because the ICC is, you know, finally after like six years, uh, may finally open investigation that, um, it's a reason for anyone not to stand up for their own for their own obligations. Okay. Now, with regard to those obligations and what what can be done, uh, maybe I'll just say you know something like something would be nice as a, as, as a beginning, uh, but something new, right? Because like like so much you know repeated statements. You know we have oceans of of these statements, uh, and everyone can just look at the reality on the ground and see how successful those statements have been, right? So, you know, spare us the statements, spare us the expressions of concern, sometimes of grave concern, and so on. We've been saying this for so many years, I mean, that long already, like Israel can live with X more decades of other oceans of statements, that's not gonna make any difference, right? Uh, and we shouldn't, you know, ac accept that, that, you know, th that's as, as good as it gets in terms of, in terms of consequences. Uh, the world has res not only responsibility, the world also has leverage. And it's a political choice so far not to use that leverage. That's, that's where we are. I don't think anyone in, in, in London or in any other uh, world capital needs B'Tselem's advice as to the ways in which the world can use its, its leverage uh, and not just talk the talk, continue talking the empty talk, but beginning to, to walk the walk. Uh, everyone knows the leverage that they have and the ways in which it can be used. And everyone acknowledges that the only reason this isn't happening is because it's a political choice of convenience to ignore the rights of Palestinians to ignore their oppression uh, and to continue to have um, a relationship with Israel in a way that, and here I circle back to the elections tomorrow, that basically spells out to those that do have political rights in, the, in this country and that will vote again tomorrow, that the world is fine with Israeli apartheid against Palestinians, that the world is accepting this with impunity, with no consequences. And so the privileged millions that have political rights can go ahead and vote again and vote on other issues that concern them because they suffer no consequences, they face no consequences to what we're doing to Palestinians. And in that sense, it's a repeated international intervention in domestic politics by spelling out every day that there is no crisis in Israel's international standing and that everyone is fine with what we're doing to Palestinians. So we can just proceed uh, in the way that we have been proceeding 
uh, for so many decades already. The moment that changes, and it only depends on political will, nothing else, the moment that changes, we have a fighting chance uh, to see a different future here. As long as that doesn't happen, things are going to continue moving in the same trajectory that they've been moving so far. That's it. Thank you, uh, Haggai. And it, it reminds me that actually we, we've just passed the three year anniversary when our beloved prime minister in this country um, actually did an interview with the Jerusalem Post and said Israel had to choose between a two state solution or an apartheid system. Um, I'm not sure he'd repeat the, that sort of sentiment uh, today. But uh, Diana, uh, what are your thoughts on what the international community should do? Um, I just love the way that Haggai said it. Something, um, because we've been sitting around waiting for such a long time. And, you know, you, we can uh, practically copy paste the same statements that were written in the year 2000 with the statements that were written in 2010, with the rate statements that were written in 2020, with the statements that are being written now in 2021. Um, the date changes, sometimes they add the word grave concern, sometimes they remove the, the, ter the term grave concern, but the consistency has been that nothing gets done about it. And, uh, and this is why I think that for us, I'm not holding my breath that anything is going to be ha happening on a state level. I don't think that we have to get, that we should give, give up. I think we have to continue to be pushing and continue to be demanding because the cracks are already starting to emerge. Um, we are already seeing that people are talking, not only talking about apartheid, but talking about Israel being an oppressor. Um, and beyond that, they're talking about, the, about uh, Zionism. They're talking about the settler colonial regime. And it's starting to, it's starting to make waves, but, it, but it's not yet enough. I think that the bigger issue for me is, um, while I'm not going to hold my breath that something's going to happen other than you know, the statements that are copy paste, grave concern, less grave concern, whatever. I do believe in the power of people. And I believe that this is why it's so important for us to be continuing to push for, um, for BDS, to be continuing to pushing for boycotts, for divestment, for sanctions, not just in the West Bank, um, and not just in, in, in relation to, um, to settlements, but even beyond that. And I also think that um, it's very important for us to continue to, um, to try to work within our systems to make sure that people understand what it means to be supporting Israel. I believe that, that one, one of the great things about this um, report is, and one of the things that B'Tselem is doing, is that they're holding up a mirror to Israeli society and saying to Israeli society, is this where, where, you, where you want to be? And I think that it's so important for us to continue to hold up that mirror and then turn it to, the, to Israel's supporters and say, is this really what you want to be continuing to support? Is this really where we want things to be continuing to do? So I don't have... Um, this huge faith that something's going to happen overnight within the international system. But I do have faith that people are going to change the system. And we've already seen those changes um, taking shape slowly, but they are taking shape. The other thing I think we really need to focus on is, is on media and making sure that media exactly understand what it means to be a Palestinian living under this under this regime. Uh, the, the fact that Palestinian voices are um, ignored or, or muted is something that should really be causing us um, alarm and we, we must be demanding better and greater. Thank you very much. <clears throat> really, it's been a great pleasure. You make a great double act, uh, Diana and Haggai. Um, it's been a privilege to, <coughs> to compare you both. So I'm going to hand over. Thank you to everyone who made those great questions as well. But hand back to Benjamin from PSC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And look, can, you, um, can I conclude, first of all, by asking you all to join me in a, a virtual thank you uh, to, as Chris said, an outstanding double act, to Haggai and Deanna, not just for their outstanding contributions tonight, but for the important work they're both doing uh, in bringing this crucial analysis 
into the mainstream. And I, I want to finish by picking up on something Chris said earlier about resistance to this narrative. Last November, I think it was, PSC undertook a virtual lobby of Parliament which foregrounded uh, this apartheid uh, analysis. And we encountered MPs, as Chris said, who, whilst not necessarily persuaded that such narratives were anti-Semitic, indicated they felt them to be extreme, they felt them to be divisive, and they gave them a sense of discomfort. Uh, to me, in many ways, this is a similar experience to those who say, look, being confronted by the truths of Britain's imperial and colonial history, and if you like, the part played in it by men like Churchill is discomforting. It confronts people with truths that they would rather not confront. But one cannot tackle an injustice unless one names it. As Betzalem say so eloquently, uh, in their report, as painful as it is to look reality in the eye, it is more painful to live under a boot. Again, as Betzalem say in the conclusion to the report, there are various political paths to a just future between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, but all of us must first choose to say no to apartheid. And history has taught us what saying no apartheid means. Remember the words of Desmond Tutu who told us that in a situation of justice and injustice one cannot be neutral because to be so is to be on the side of the oppressor. Saying no to apartheid means naming it and then refusing to cooperate with us. Now there are MPs on this call and whatever, whatever our views about the likelihood as Deanna said of imminent change, our message to them our call on them does not alter. Our message we give them to take back to Parliament is that you either refuse to cooperate militarily, politically, financially with an apartheid regime, or you are complicit in sustaining it. So an end to the two-way arms trade, an end to all trade that supports violations of international law and human rights and for public bodies including universities and local authorities saying no to apartheid means ending all investments in institutions and companies and corporations complicit in supporting apartheid this is the work we are driving here in the uk with the support of many other civil society partners as betzalem say finally recognizing the apartheid nature of the regime does not mean giving up on the contrary it is a call for change. So thank you all for attending tonight. Please join us, add your voice, add your energy in fighting to help make that change. Thank you all for coming.